this one uh, should be a short presentation. Um, this raw line, uh, we just submitted this fairly recently. Um, let's see where this is going to be published. Uh, but this is basically a, a kind of finished work. We're building on top of it already. Um, but even though it's not published, let's say I'm, I'm confident in presenting this to you. So uh, let me start off with some background. Yeah, this goes in the same direction as this raw hash work that John presented uh, recently. Um, so I'm using some of John's background slides here. Uh, so recall these uh, nanopore sequencers. Um, they're kind of these tiny devices. They're mobile. And uh, one interesting bit is that it enables real-time analysis of the data. Um, so when we get, when we run them, somehow we have the molecules going through a nanopore. We measure some kind of ionic current that flows through there, which ends up as a really a raw signal measurement for us. Yeah? We're no longer dealing with ACGTs. We're dealing with, well, <laughs> they call this squiggles in the literature. Um, think of them with plots, as plots, as you, if you will, uh, or a floating point arrays. Um, and interestingly, we get those plots in real time. And that's why this slide is so nicely animated. So while they're being produced, we can analyze them already. And if we do it quickly enough, we can uh, interact with the sequencer. And um, we can perhaps stop it while it's still running and save time. Right? If we stop sequencing one molecule, we can already start on the next one early before it will have finished. So the earlier you stop, uh, the quicker you can start on another useful one. So latency is kind of a key issue here. Um, yeah, so we want to have high throughput, but also latency is, is a huge thing. Um, first of all, then in end-to-end -end application, not just to make a decision to stop early, uh, we also want to have low latency in the end-to-end -end application, which kind of is neat. If you can do it while still being sequenced, you can uh, already be analyzing, that means you overlap these somehow. Um, and then if you do this early stopping, uh, that means you can stop even earlier because you don't even need to wait for the full sequencing to finish. Um, so real-time analysis is a new opportunity with this technology. Uh, we want to have rapid analysis, meaning high throughput, throughput that matches the sequencer somehow. Um, we want to have timely decisions. Yeah. It should be quick in the sense that as the sequencer keeps sequencing, we'd perhaps like to stop as early as possible if we can stop. Um, that's, so that's about latency, throughput, latency. Uh, then we'd like to be accurate. Our decisions should be correct. We don't want to throw away useful data and so on. And finally, it should be power efficient. Clearly, if the sequencer uh, is portable, uh, this is like, I don't know, my clicker here is almost the size of one of these sequencers. Um, and it works on USB power. So if, if that's kind of low energy and portable already, I don't want to carry around a huge server uh, to analyze the data from that sequencer. So uh, quick, uh, uh, basically the new metric that was added in there is latency. And right? we want to be high throughput and low power before, now we also want to be low latency. Um, one issue we've been seeing is that in these real-time analysis works, uh, they tend to fail to scale. They fail to scale to large uh, reference databases. So for example, the human genome, right, that's some three gigabytes of ACGT. Um, it, yeah, somehow these methods just don't do a good job for these larger reference genomes. Uh, they work well for small reference genomes. So for example, COVID, a COVID reference genome is only, I think some 30,000 characters long. Um, and then it's somehow a computational easier problem. And then we have a bunch of good works that do a good job, uh, but not so much for large reference genomes. Um, so our goal here is to, well, to get all these target metrics, right? Throughput, uh, low latency, high accuracy, low memory usage, and so on, uh, for a wide range of reference database sizes. We want to have one tool, just give it data and it does its thing. We don't need to specially configure it, whatever. Uh, or even worse, develop a new tool 
entirely. Um, so this is the proposed raw line. This is the first seed filter seed filter align mapper <laughs> for raw nanopore signals, um, and it turns out it does a really good job uh, at mapping raw signals to a large reference database with high accuracy, but it doesn't just work for large reference database, it generalizes well. Um, while still having similar throughput to raw hash, it significantly improves accuracy everywhere. Yeah, so uh, I, just as a reminder, this raw nanopore signal analysis, uh, we get a raw signal out of the sequence, you know, these squiggles floating point arrays. Now with a conventional analysis pipeline, this would be going through base calling, uh, so we, we would convert this to ACGTs, and then you would put this into a read mapper. You get out mapping locations, and you can run some kind of downstream analysis. Then you have an end-to-end -end application. Uh, in the raw signal pipeline, we skip the base caller. We don't ever convert to ACGTs. We directly map to a reference. And then we call this a raw signal mapper. Raw line and raw hash are such raw signal mappers. They directly get the raw signal and produce mapping locations. Um, this first conventional pipeline, it works, it's accurate, uh, but it's cost and power hungry. Also not so low latency. Um, still for, for accuracy, it's kind of a good baseline, um, but it doesn't somehow satisfy multiple of the uh, targets that we have in mind. Um, the, Real-time analysis, the raw signal baselines we have, uh, they work well. They somehow can directly use all the information in the raw signal, um, and they scale scale better. They're less power hungry, um, and we have higher throughput, lower latency. That's nice, uh, but this is a somehow challenging problem to do well. Um, so, as I said, these don't scale too well, unfortunately don't have high accuracy for large references. So um, the reason why this is the case is for small reference genomes, um, so I get few candidate regions. So you get a read, you get a bunch of candidates from seeding, and uh, then you evaluate each of those candidates. The, if you have only a few candidates, meaning you have a the reason for having few candidates is you have a small reference database, so there's just not many candidates to be found in that really. Um, then it's somehow easier to pick the right one among the candidates, and you can also do it at the high throughput because you have a smaller database to search. For a large reference, the key difference is now all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of candidates. Right? So think of the COVID example. If you compare it to 30,000 characters, maybe you can find a handful of locations where a read might match. But now if you compare to the human reference with 3 billion characters, right, it's like 10,000 times larger reference. Correct? No, it's not correct. Is it 100,000 times? 100,000 times, I believe. Um, all of a sudden, you have to pick the right one among 100,000 times as many candidates, and you have to analyze 100 thousand times as many candidates. So it's both less accuracy and reduced throughput, yeah? more computational load, um, more energy cost, and well, simply a more challenging computational problem. So uh, large genomes are inherently difficult, and that's why we propose this raw line work. And so again, as a reminder, our goal is to satisfy all these targets for a wide range of reference database sizes, but in particular, these large reference genomes, because the small ones are already kind of solved. Well, not solved, but we're doing a reasonably good job at it again. <laughs> There's always more work to be done, but it works. Um, so if you recall in the raw hash, we uh, generate candidates using um, by, by converting the reference genome using well, some pre-processing steps uh, to a quantized signal representation. And then we quantize the raw signal in the same way. We apply hashing, uh, end up with a hash table, and then we get out candidate locations. Um, in the case of raw hash, we're done at this point. There's the full mapping. Yeah? You get the hash table, you do 
chaining and mapping. So uh, if I draw this visually, in raw hash, we have two key steps here. You have seeding, which gets individual small exact matches between the reference on the y-axis and the read on the x-axis. So, so I drew this simply as a point whenever you have a small exact match between the two. And then what raw hash does is it runs chaining. So it tries to somehow find a set of nicely collinear candidates or anchors. Um, this is also a dynamic programming algorithm, but somehow a coarse grained algorithm, right? It just has to connect them to each other. It doesn't evaluate what's in between. Um, what we now have in raw align, yeah, note the, the title changed. <laughs> uh, in raw align, we get this alignment step afterwards. The alignment step uh, does a much more fine grained evaluation. It comes after chaining. Um, and the key idea here is that while the first two steps are somehow relative coarse grained comparison between the two signals, um, it works fast. Uh, the alignment step is a much more fine grained comparison, but it's also highly accurate. So if you look over here in this uh, plot, here you just have straight lines. I uh, made them striped to uh, emphasize that these don't really mm, look at what's in between these gaps. It's more about the connection between the points. What you have in alignment is a very fine grained line here. In fact, that every index here from 200 to 300 yeah, goes in increments of one, you have a specific point where they align with each other. And you evaluate all those points with dynamic programming. So you, you compare both sequences to each other in a very fine grained manner. You check, do they really match everywhere or where do they not match? Um, which is more costly to do computationally, but it's much more accurate. Um, so, we want to do alignment. <laughs> There's this, we're not, we didn't invent alignment. Um, alignment has been done since the 70s. Um, it always ends up looking as some variant of a dynamic programming table. Um, specifically in this case, this is somehow needleman wunsch based. Yeah? You put the reference on one axis, you read on the other axis, and then you have a dynamic programming formula that you use to fill out the entries. So this is a very simple arithmetic calculation. Um, you somehow compare two characters of your read and reference, and then you do simple arithmetic, take the minimum of it, that's your new entry. And as before, three neighbor entries, one new one calculated. That's what we've been using since the 70s to compare base called sequences. Um, note that we're having an exact comparison there between nucleotide bases, yeah? meaning you, for example, compare, I don't know, is A equal to C? And if it's equal, you uh, add zero. If it's unequal, you add one. Is A equal to A? Yes, no cost, okay. Um, now, when we worked with raw signals, we instead apply dynamic time warping. One major key difference here being that we have numeric signal values. Right? We have two floating point arrays. The read and the reference are now not ACGTs, but floating point arrays, meaning if, uh, if you ever try to work with floating points, um, comparing them exactly is a really stupid th thing to do most of the time. You will almost never get an exact, exactly matching floating point value. What you need to do is have some kind of loose comparison between floating point values. Now you could say, okay, are they within some threshold of each other? Um, but another way to express similar notion of floating point similarity is to just subtract them, right? Subtract them, get the absolute difference. Um, and then, well, if they're exactly equal, you have a difference of zero. If they're highly dissimilar, you have a difference of, well, if you normalize, you have a difference of one. Nevertheless, no matter how you exactly score these, right, this is kind of a minor change. At the end of the day, you still have a dynamic programming table, simple arithmetic operations, a minimum operation that's calculated from, from uh, three neighbors. Um, so 
conceptually, this looks extremely similar. And it makes sense that it would also work for raw signals if it works for a base called sequences. So that's what we did. That was our intuition. And well, it turns out it works quite well, actually. Um, there are some challenges in making this work, though. So I told you it's costly to do, right? Um, it's not just costly to align. Uh, the alignment albums are also called very frequently. So for each candidate, right, I told you about the human reference genome, 3 billion characters in there. And potentially at any of these 3 billion characters, you might have a candidate. Um, now, these previous steps, fortunately, seeding and chaining filter out many of these candidates, but you still have very many to evaluate. Um, so if you have an expensive uh, aligned algorithm where each call already is expensive and you call it frequently, then you're running into a performance bottleneck. So we uh, took many steps here. Yeah, so I need to amend this picture here. It's slow, unfortunately. Um, so what we did to, uh, oh, right, the reason why it's slow. Such nice animations. Um, the reason why this is slow, yeah, this is just the third step. Um, the dynamic programming table scales with the square of the read length of the really the candidate region. It's literally a square table of the exact size of what you're trying to align. Um, so this scales with like n times m, right? which is, well, it works for a few hundred characters, but it's already too much kind of because you're calling it frequently. So we had to take some steps to make this efficient. Right? Our first version, when we integrated this into raw hash, um, it was terribly slow. <laughs> it was uh, like it took a few days to just run a simple experiment to check if the idea works in principle. Um, on the same data set that raw hash took one hour. Uh, so this was not really usable at that point. Nevertheless, actually, we did get an accuracy improvement out of it already. So we at least knew conceptually this would work, uh, but we need to make it fast. So what we did is we used the pre-aligning filtering, chaining, and this is already in raw hash actually. This reduces the number of candidates that you have, the number of times that the aligned algorithm is called. Um, then we developed some early termination strategy. Um, this is another variation of branch and bound. It's a very old idea uh, that's also applied in all kinds of places, including um, like the Minimax algorithm, yeah, a chess engine. Um, basically, if, as soon as you, as you have found a good candidate, uh, you don't need to evaluate things that are, are already provably worse. Um, if you have found a really nicely long alignment between the read and the reference, then everything else that's obviously shorter that can no longer be better, you can just stop analyzing already. Um, this saves a bunch of time. Then you can do anchor guided alignment, basically just align the bits between the red dots that I showed earlier instead of the full square table. Uh, you can do banding windowing, which is like going only through a diagonal band of the matrix. It's also an old technique. And then, of course, finally, you can work from the harder side and implement it very efficiently. So what we did here is we used vectorization, SIMD, um, to get well to get the most out of the CPU. This is currently not really hard accelerated outside of uh, SIMD, but in principle, of course, you could replace step five here by developing another dynamic time warping accelerator. Um, so, uh, wow, we went back by a slide. There we go. Uh, we explain all of these in a lot of detail, of course. In the paper, there's a bunch of nice algorithm insights in there. Um, and well, I'm, I'll show you our, our code in a second. Uh, so we evaluate this on a fairly recent uh, CPU. Um, we used 64 threads for multiple baselines, including raw hash. Um, and then we evaluated three use cases. Basically, we, we ran the equivalent evaluation again that we had in the raw hash. Um, 
to show in a fair manner that, yes, look, in the same setting, this really works well with alignment. Okay, so our uh, metrics that we focused on here were, were uh, memory footprint throughput, analysis latency, and sequencing latency. Um, there's two types of latencies in here. Basically, the first one is the analysis latency is time spent computing. So how many cycles your CPU is working on the analysis. And then the sequencing latency is how much data do you need? So you have your, you have your DNA right, that comes through the pore. Let this be the nanopore. <laughs> Um, you have your DNA that flows through the nanopore, and while you're analyzing, uh, this keeps flowing. Now, you'd like to stop this as early as possible if you can make a decision. Um, but nevertheless, you, you can't really compute immediately. Like, you need some amount of data to start computing and make a decision, right? You need to wait a bit before you even start analyzing. And if you well, depending on the tool, you need more or less data to make a good decision. So one key metric is how much data does your computational approach need to even start making a decision. That's the sequencing latency. And then finally, we have accuracy, of course, which is kind of obvious that you need to analyze it. Uh, we have analyzed on a bunch of data sets yeah, across a variety of genomes. Um, I mentioned earlier COVID, which is the uh, smallest of our examples, by the way, there's the genome size, 29,900 base pairs, apparently. Um, and the largest one we analyzed is the human genome. Then you have a bunch of mixed data sets to uh, evaluate metagenomic use cases, which is the methodology used in Rohash. OK, uh, let's look at some plots. <laughs> so if we plot our five metrics as a spider chart here, yeah, so we, we each point is one of our metrics, and then uh, you, you, well, you just draw a spider chart. So a larger area is better. The best tool would fill out the entire area all the time. Um, so we did that on this D3 yeast data set for our baselines and draw line. And oh, well, we're seeing quite a nice thing here. Draw line uh, somehow does really well in all metrics. If you look at the baseline tools, so raw line is in blue, yeah? Um, if you look at the baseline tools, let's say, uh, let's pick SIGMAP here. Uh, SIGMAP has kind of low analysis latency. It does well in sequencing latency. Uh, it has good accuracy, well, reasonable accuracy. But SIGMAP, for example, has terrible memory footprint. Um, now if you look at raw line, it, okay, it has the best analysis latency, best throughput, best accuracy, not quite the best sequencing latency, but it's, it's up there. And uh, it's also reasonable in terms of memory footprint. And if you look at the other ones, well, raw line is the only one that kind of generalizes well in terms of doing well in all metrics. And then, of course, in two of the key metrics, yeah? Accuracy and throughput, it's doing extremely well. Um, so I just focused on this D3, D3 yeast data set here the one we do best at. That's why I showed that one. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, we do well at all data sets here. Um, one that I want to focus here on is also these large reference databases. So this is the human and uh, relative abundance use case. Um, what I'd like to point out here is that these really difficult data sets with uh, yeah, large reference databases um, Okay, we, we don't necessarily have the best throughput. It's not the worst, but it's also not the best. Um, but we're getting really high accuracy. We're getting low sequencing latency, and we're getting low analysis latency. Um, that's important. And it's the only tool that does anywhere near reasonably well on those, um, in those metrics on those data sets. So um, I think we can claim here that Raw line does well on all kinds of reference database sizes. Yeah, these are just the numeric results for the same table, by the way. Um, I hope you're happy that I showed you the spider chart and not this. Uh, I'll show you one table, though, here, just a very brief glance. Uh, we looked at Minimap 2 also for a relative abundance use case. 
this kind of an end-to-end -end use case, a full application using that, including downstream analysis. Um, so Minimap 2 is the state-of-the-art base calling base pipe, right? I mentioned it has a bunch of downsides, this base calling base stuff. But what it's good at is accuracy. It's really the state of the art. It's the best accurate way that we have to analyze these things. Um, and we have this distance metric in the last column, lower is better. So what we see is that compared to ground truth, minimap is off by like 5%. Right? That's the best version we have. And then we have raw line and it's off by 12%. Yes, it's like has over 2x the error essentially. But if you compare that to the best previous, right? Raw line is based on raw hash. It's making like huge leaps. Um, so clearly this area of raw signal analysis is approaching base calling base analysis really, really quickly. This is the progress that was made in a few months of improving here. I'm imagining where we can be in a year or two. We're probably cracking the best baseline at that point. And uh, well, what do I say probably? There's a chance at least. Um, there's a chance we can approach that accuracy and hopefully do so at better energy, better uh, better energy cost and higher throughput, lower latency and so on. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of a hopefully motivating outlook. All right, yeah, we have, again, all the details in the paper, much more in-depth analysis and all kind of parameter sweeps and whatnot. Uh, that you need to understand for alignment. Um, and we have all of our code to produce all those results on our GitHub. Um, so this is a kind of a one-click evaluation there. You could, I think, run two commands in there that are very nicely explained in the readme, and then it would generate all the results. Now, mind you, if you don't do it with several servers, generating those results will take weeks on your PC. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it starts running at least um, if you run it. And if you work with us, well, you can run it on your own on our servers. Hey, yeah, so let me conclude. Um, we have this problem that robot signal analysis, real-time analysis works, fail to scale to large reference genomes. Um, our goal was to generalize to all kinds of reference genomes uh, while somehow fulfilling all our target metrics, uh, we proposed draw a line, this first raw signal mapper uh, that, can, that follows the seed filter align paradigm. Um, and we observed that uh, it does well on large reference databases. It's a really high accuracy. It generalizes well to all kinds of reference database sizes in all kinds of metrics. And uh, in particular, compared to raw hash, we remain at similar throughput while significantly improving accuracy. And with that, I'm done.